Good morning, family. I feel a little lethargic today. Yesterday, I just want to share real quick with you. Uh, first of all, let me slow down a second. Welcome to Seville Community Church of God. If this is your first time here, you'll get to uh, know us a little better. Sometimes I can get going on fast forward, and, and, and I have to remind myself sometimes to just slow down a little bit. I get super excited on Sunday mornings to share the gospel and just share love and compassion with people. I get going, and before you know it, Sunday service is over, and I feel like, man, I had so much more to say, and I didn't get the opportunity to share it all. But we're glad you're here, and we would just like to share a couple announcements uh, before we get going, and I'll finish the rest of that story. Uh, on August 5th, we are having a Jumping for Jesus family fun night. Uh, there'll be some worship music. There'll be an opportunity to maybe bump, set, spike in somebody's face if you want to play volleyball. It's, it's okay. That's what happens when you play volleyball against me. I like to spike, you know. I don't have that much height, but when you're playing volleyball in the sand, it's all bets off. I'm sorry. I'm coming after you. I want, I want to spike it and enjoy that moment. And anyhow, come on out. It'll be a fun night. It'll be a good time. Uh, as well as we just got news about... The Loons game, it's the last faith night of the season. Now, if we get 20 or more people, the tickets will be $12.50. Uh, if we do 20 or less, it will be $15 per, per person. It's August 11th. We'll fill in more of the details of the times. They're usually like 7-11 or something like that is their, their uh, start times. It's a Thursday night, I believe. Um, we're doing sign up at the connections table. Say again? Friday night. Friday night? Okay. It's a Friday night. So it's the day before Saturday and the day after Thursday. <laughs> we got that much figured out. So you can sign up at the table. Uh, if you would see Dana and Mark at the table, uh, they're working the connections table. Uh, we would, the sooner we get signed up, the better. Uh, you can pay them, or if somebody wants to make a donation, they're more than welcome to sponsor somebody, too. So, a little bit about yesterday. Yesterday, Seville Community Church of God combined with uh, Parkside Church, Oasis, uh, Victory out of Mount Pleasant. They have an uh, Endeavor worship team. We also had Amazing Grace from Breckenridge. Uh, they performed for a worship team as well in Parkside. Parkside's worship team was there. Uh, we served probably a little over 500 hot dogs. Uh, that is a lot of hot dogs. That's a lot of people. And we were able to just join together on a mission. And the mission was to share the gospel, just to share that love and that compassion. Uh, did anybody here share the gospel this week you did awesome fantastic you did good deal we definitely got some work to do though right we definitely got some work to do who here prayed this week yeah now we're now we're getting there now i'm gonna pray that you guys are able to share the gospel to somebody because i tell you what the country is in desperate need of prayer and the people in the community need your prayers. They, they be, they, even though the Holy Spirit is praying for us, the Holy Spirit's been praying for us since the beginning. Even though we may not know what to pray for, he does. And so what we want to do this morning, though, right now before we get going, is just turn our will over to God in prayer that he will lift us up, that we will have an interaction here at service today with God in a way that when we go out, we're praying and we're asking for strength and courage to be able to share the gospel with somebody that does not know Jesus. I had a couple interactions yesterday that just absolutely floored me. 
and I'm truly grateful that God's blessed me with the opportunity to have a relationship with him because without the strength of the Holy Spirit, I definitely would have crumbled and not had the opportunity to love them people that needed that love and share them, share with them. Let's go ahead and bow our heads and close our eyes and take that posture of prayer. Father God, we just thank you so much for the opportunity to come together as a family this morning, that we would be able to be here together to give you glory through worship music, through prayer, through the, the message that Pastor Bob Fall is going to share with us. Lord, we would ask that you would be with the worship team, that you'd be with Pastor Matt as he shares when we go to the tithe. Lord, we would ask that you would be with each individual here today, that you would lift them up and give them strength, courage, and wisdom, that you would allow them to be able to go into the world to share the message of your son, Jesus Christ, that you were fully human, that God, that you were fully human and you came to earth as Jesus Christ and that you would live a life that we cannot live and that you would surrender your son's life on the cross for our sins. And that when we would accept that sacrifice for the atonement for our sins, Lord, that we would be able to have an interaction with the Holy Spirit that would lift us up and change our ways from the way we were to the way you desire us to be, that our will will become your will, and we will be able to unite in love, compassion, mercy, and grace to represent your son, Jesus Christ, as we call ourselves Christians, little Christ. We aim to be more like you, Lord, in everything that we do, from the way we speak, the way that we act, May it represent the kingdom and the world that you design to give you glory in everything that we do. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, all God's people said. Amen. This morning, let's all sing loudly and join the worship team as they represent us as Seville Community Church of God in worship. So go ahead and let's begin to worship the Lord. And you may be seated. All right, lots to go over today in Ephesians. We're going to start the fifth chapter, but in order to do that, I'm going to kind of reiterate where we've come uh, so we have a good grasp of uh, where we're going. Uh, we have been studying through the book of Ephesians uh, for several, several, several weeks, and we'll be uh, in Ephesians for several more weeks. We're literally preaching verse by verse through the entire book of Ephesians. Ephesians is kind of challenging sometimes. Uh, Paul doesn't pull any punches, and he is uh, writing directly to us. I'm going to share today's focus scripture, and then I'll go back and add some context, and we'll just take it a verse at a time, okay? Let's look at that. Ephesians chapter 5. We're going to look at uh, verses 1 through 5 today. So Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 through 5 says this, Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But sexual immorality and all impurity and, or uh, covetousness must not even be named among you as is proper among saints. Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place. But instead, let there be thanksgiving. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or who is covetous, that is an idol idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ in God. May God add his blessing to his word, his scripture reading this morning. Now, we're wading into some very countercultural waters. So before I do that, I'm going to ask God to bless this, to open your ears, to soften your hearts as God cuts against what seems so normal to us. 
AKA, I'll probably get canceled after something like this. So let's ask his strength and his guidance and his wisdom. Father, thank you so much for the opportunity just to dig into your word. Father, soften our hearts, open our ears, that we would receive the message you have for each and every one of us today. Use us as instruments to reflect your glory to an otherwise unknowing world. Help us uh, be bold and, wi and wise as we study your word. It's in Jesus' name we ask these things. And the entire church said, Amen. Amen. So just to recap, Paul, so far in the first four chapters of Ephesians, has reminded us of our calling. Um, he has written Ephesians as a circulatory letter. So Ephesians, the book of Ephesians, is a letter that was sent out in the first century, early church, that was meant to be read in different gatherings. That's what ecclesia, that's what church was, that's what church is. It's a gathering of believers. So somebody would come in and then they'd say, hey, hey, we got a letter from the Apostle Paul, and they would read it, to the hearers, and, and Paul would exhort them to different things. Now, sometimes Paul wrote to specific churches, uh, but most scholars believe that Ephesians was made to be circulatory, made to be uh, read at different congregations. Now, we remember who Paul is, or Paul was. Paul was the biggest persecutor of the Jews. Paul was a, a good Jewish person who believed that Christianity, or these people following the way, were bad Jewish people. That they believed that the Messiah had come. And they were going all over the countryside telling people that. And Paul viewed that as blasphemous. So he sought to put an end to it. And so he did. Paul actually persecuted, uh, uh, persecuted and chased after Christians at that time. And sometimes put them to death. Maybe not at his hand, but he certainly held the coats of people who did the stoning. Then Paul had an encounter with Jesus. And nobody's ever the same when they have an encounter with Jesus. And Paul is no exception. In fact, Paul goes from the biggest persecutor of Christianity to the biggest evangelical the world has ever known. Uh, we wouldn't probably have church as we know it today without the likes of Paul. Paul preached to the Gentiles or the non-Jewish people. So that's Paul's story and, or his story. And he's telling us, he's so far exhorted us that you are called. So Christian, if you're a believer, this letter's for you. You don't get to be on the sidelines in Christianity. You are called to the faith uh, and Paul is going to lay out what that looks like. And when we examine that against reality, when we examine that against ourselves, sometimes it hurts. So if you can't say amen with scripture, you ought to say ouch. But that's an opportunity for us to change those areas that God wants us to change. So we're going to jump into that. So last time, Paul was exhorting us to walk in a new life. To walk in light, not darkness. And Paul says that the world and the worldly system is darkness, but not you, Christian. You're to walk in light. The last couple times, Paul contrasted this, and he had some <clears throat> very stark things to say about how the world does things and how the world lives. Now, so far, we got how the world walks in futility and ignorance and is darkened and Paul urged us to put away falsehoods and he was largely focused on our interpersonal relationships with one another. How do we act as believers amongst ourselves? Keeping our emotions in check as not to become bitter or angry or spiteful or resentful but today, Paul is going to button up that section and start a new section of what it looks like in a group setting, a church setting, a gathering setting. Let's look at it uh, just a verse or two at a time. Ephesians 1 through 2 says this. <clears throat> Paul writes, Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love, as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Now, 
Let's, a uh, couple words there uh, that'll help us clear up this scripture. Paul has summed up everything he's talked about in verse, or chapter 4. It's really weird that they start a new chapter here, but chapters and verses aren't inspired. They, they didn't exist in the old papyri and in old transmissions. They were late, they were added much, much later for just a helpful tool. But Paul takes the first two verses of chapter 5 to sum up what he's already talked about. He's also slightly shifting from walking in light to walking in love. So he said, walk in light, he described all that, what the world looks like in darkness, to what we ought to look like walking in light. There's a slight shift where Paul's going to say, now walk in love. And he says, be imitators. Imitators of God. Imitators, Christians should be an imitator of God because they are a child of God. Is all a creation a child of God? No. Those who believe in him are called children of God. Jesus himself says, others are children of the devil. We'll more on that in just a few moments here. But as children often imitate their parents, we ought to be imitators of our heavenly father. And he says, as Christ loved. That is, imitating God... Following the example Christ gave. Listen, our distinguishing mark as Christians should be costly, sacrificial love. Listen, the distinguishing mark of followers of Jesus ought to be the costly and sacrificial love. That is a fragrant offering to God. That means something pleasing to God. Costly, sacrificial love. The greater the sacrifice, the greater the demonstration of love. I'll give you some examples. When people don't feel loved, and I get with them, and we counsel, we do some biblical counseling, when people don't feel loved in a relationship, it can often be traced to a perception of the sacrifice around love. I can say I love you, but it needs to be demonstrated. And when it's not demonstrated, through sacrifice, it doesn't feel like love. Those five big areas, the five love languages, you, most of you have read that, are like time spent. Right? So if I never spend time with my wife, if I tell my wife I love you, but I golf all day long, or after I get out of work, I go hit the golf course, what is my action saying? I'm sacrificing time with my wife to go golf. What do I love more? What's the greater sacrifice? My golf game. I can say I love you, but then give my energy to something not important to my wife or to any relationship. You can add this in there. Where I direct my energy is where my love is. Affection, that's another big area. What I give affection to, acknowledgement or touch, acknowledging the presence of somebody, is a demonstration of love. I have to go out of my way to acknowledge somebody. I have to stop what I'm doing to go and uh, show somebody affection. I'm sacrificing what I'm doing at the moment to go do that. That demonstrates my love. Gifts, buying somebody gifts or getting somebody gifts, is use that, that are, especially gifts that are useful or meaningful to the other person, is a sacrifice that I can demonstrate because I'm stopping... I'm not thinking about what I need and what gifts I would like to buy, but that person in my relationship that I want to show love to. Or even words. Words that match an action. Not empty, disingenuous words, but words that match. So every demonstration of love has an act of sacrifice to it. Do you agree with that? Nod your head if you agree. You agree with that, right? The more I sacrifice, the bigger deal it is, the more time, more energy, more affection that I put into something, 
at the expense of myself the greater demonstration of love. Okay? Christ Jesus is the greatest sacrifice. Why? He gave his life for you. His life. He can't give no more. Not only his life, but his perfect life. Not only a peasant life, or not even a peasant life, a king's life. A holy life. A perfect life. For yours. It's probably not perfect. Paul reminds us, be imitators of that kind of love. Be imitators and walk in that kind of love. That is the distinguishing mark. If everyone did that, it would look a certain way when we gather together. And when I say church in this setting, I mean not the church building, not the pews, not... I'm talking about the gathering of God's people. If everybody did that, it would look a certain way, right? Paul's going to describe what that looks like here in verse 3. He's going to start, But sexual immorality and all impurity and covetousness must not be even named among you, as is proper among saints. Self-centered vices are the opposite of self-sacrificial love. Things that I do that I want for my benefit is the antithesis. It's the opposite of self-sacrificing love. Paul turns up the screws. Let me tell you what some of these words mean. Sexual immorality. Uh, pornea is the Greek word. It's where we get the word pornography. It's whoredom. It's selling out. It's, it's this idea of you're selling off your purity. That's what this means. That's what the idea is that's implied here in sexual immorality. Some translations will translate that all different kinds of ways, but the Greek idea, the idea there is this idea of, of selling something very important at a very, very low cost. Impurity, the, the, the word there, dross, is this uh, stuff that when you heat silver to the point that it melts, and there's a lot of this imagery in the New Testament, when you melt silver down to it melts, this stuff called dross will uh, float up to the top, and then you scoop that off. And you do this more and more and more, the silver becomes more silver and more silver. You're taking out the impurities. That's the idea here. So all those impurities got to gone. So they're refined in heat, and we scoop the dross out. That's the idea there. Covetousness is want or desire. And then saints here, hagios, is believer or follower of Christ. You are a saint, Christian. In the eyes of God, you're a saint. In the Catholic tradition, they will give people or denote sainthood. Uh, but in this biblical idea, uh, you are a believer and you are, in that sense, a saint. Now, in order to really understand this and really set this up, we need to understand what makes things bad. This concept of evil or not good. God determines what's good and what's bad. So a perversion of something is when I use something outside of its intended use. Here's a good example. So I was a mechanic for many, many years, uh, have lots of money wrapped up in tools, and everybody knows Snap-on, right? There's no stamp on, super expensive, but high quality tools, I'll give them that, but pricey. But everything's got a lifetime warranty on it. Uh, one time I bought a big screwdriver from Snap-on, uh, and I was using it to pry open a door on a loader. Guess what happened? It broke. It snapped off. And I thought to myself, the amount of money I paid for that screwdriver, when the tool truck comes, no problem, I'll just get a new one. When I seen the Snap-on guy, I said, hey, Screwdriver broke. He goes, my goodness. What kind of screw were you trying to take off with that thing? I said, I wasn't. I was actually trying to pry a door open. He goes, oh, I'm glad you told me that. I can't warrant you that. I said, whoa, 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 buddy. Not okay. I paid the extra money to buy your screwdriver because it has a warranty on it. A lifetime warranty against breakage. He goes, yes, as long as you're using it the way it's intended to be used. 
you just told me you were prying something. I sell pry bars. Would you like one? <laughs> Anything outside the intended use of something is a perversion of that something. Does that make sense? Nod your head if that makes sense. That's evil. When I use something outside of its intended purpose, that is bad. That is impurity. That's the idea here that's being described. Now here's the thing. We have to establish the purpose, in this case, of the sexual relationship in order to determine what is it and what is it not. What is the intention of it and what is not the intention of it. And God does this. The intention of the sexual relationship is uniting a couple to become one flesh. It is the closest you could ever physically be to somebody. And there's a spiritual component. God said so. We have to establish the purpose. In other words, it's life-giving. It's a depiction of one flesh. It brings glory to God. It's a uniting act that leads to life as God intended it to be lived. The desire for anything outside of God's intended purpose for our bodies should not even be named among us. L read that. The de desire for anything outside of God's intended purpose for our bodies should not even be named among us among us. It's not an option for you, church. Now, if you're not in the church, if you're not a believer, plug your ears. This does not pertain to you. But if you say you're a follower of Jesus, Paul is saying anything outside of God's intended purpose is not an option for you. Yeah, we're just going to talk about it. No. Yeah, we're just going to... No. Stop. You can't talk about it. You can't go down that road. What's the big deal? What's the big deal? Well, it starts with a conversation. Did God really say? Then a consideration. Well, maybe he didn't. Then adaptation. Oh, we can just change that a little bit. And it ends with celebration. Every sin. Test that. First talk about it. Then consider it. Then adapt. Before you know it, you'll be throwing parades and baking cakes and celebrating it. It's the fall of man. Every time. Every time. Paul's warning is here, these things should not be named among you, church. I was teaching at Bay Aranac Career Center, or Bay City. We were starting up a diesel heavy equipment program, and it was my first venture into public education, and I loved it. The type of kids that would come and uh, be in my class were like good down-home farm kids that like to get dirty and run diesel engines and equipment. It was like Tim the Tool Man Taylor. I was in my heyday. Loved it. But I had to go. I was an outside employee. I had to go to this continuing education stuff. And we're in this room, this auditorium, where they brought in a professor from Delta College, a distinguished doctor from Delta College. And she proceeds to talk about things that I could not figure out had anything to do with diesel and heavy equipment repair. She started talking about how her uh, uterus was tilted and she was very confused growing up and she was always way better at sports than all of the other girls that she competed against. So it must be she should have been a guy. And that as a teacher that we ought to be able to relate to those students. I literally stood up and I said, hey, I don't mean to be rude, but what, what's this have to do with diesel engines? What, what's this have to do with hydraulics and, and safety? 
She goes, well, you may be in a situation where you need to talk to one of your students because they're a little confused. I said, no, ma'am. <laughs> I am not about to talk to a student about their sexual proclivities, their gender identity. If it doesn't have anything to do with what I'm teaching, I ain't doing it. And I walked out. Because I didn't want to name it among me. I didn't want to have a conversation about it. I didn't want to consider it. So I left. Two minutes later, the guy that teaches plumbing, he left. The guy that teaches HVAC, he left. The electrical class, that guy left. She forgot she was talking to a bunch of tradesmen. And then the principal emailed everybody and said, I'm so sorry, I had no idea she was going to do that. But the idea, my point with all of that, Paul says, don't do this. Don't do this, church. I didn't try to change anybody's mind. I didn't try to convince them of my biblical worldview. I just left. I said, well, this is a conversation I ought not be a part of anymore. Have a good day. And I still had a job. Uh, remarkably, I, I still had a job afterwards. I think God blessed that. I'm not saying it's easy to do things like that. I'm not saying it's easy to do things like that, but the instructions are simple and they're very clear. Paul says don't do this. It starts with conversation, then consideration, then adaptation. Pretty soon you'll be celebrating it. Verse 4, he goes on there to say, Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place. But instead... Let there be thanksgiving. Uh, filthiness is obscenity, shameless talk. A foolish talk there is um, just uh, stupid or invalid words. Quite literally, that's what they mean. They're, they're futile words. They don't mean anything. Uh, or crude joking. Uh, some of your translations say jesting. The idea there is like vulgarness uh, at the expense of somebody else. Uh, or something, some other thing. They're out of place. He's saying, not here, not in my presence. When I was in construction, there were many times where I'd try to fit into the workplace, and I just couldn't. When I gave my life to the Lord, especially when I got into ministry, there was lots of conversations where I just had to get up and quietly leave. Not lecture anybody, not tell them they're wrong, not throw my finger in their face, but I would just get up and leave. In fact, uh, towards the end of my career, I didn't even go into the break room. I'd just hang out in my car or go for a walk or something like that because I, I, I just couldn't condone what they were saying. And, and the worst part is I didn't want anybody else to think that I condoned what they were saying. Again, that's hard. Some of us are in workplaces where that's the culture around us. And we don't want to be labeled uh, whatever crude or a stick in the mud or whatever it is. Or we're just trying to get along to get along. And, and we don't want to rock the boat too much. I understand that. I get it. I felt those things as well. But let me encourage you, Christian. The more you do that, the more you'll stop caring what they think. I have many stories of leaving a conversation and it leading to a witness event where God changed somebody. God will use that and God will bless that. But it's very, very clear. Sometimes we need to get up and we need to leave. Paul's not saying humor itself is bad. I love humor. I love comedy. I love a well-placed, well-timed joke, especially a practical joke. I really do. I, I enjoy those things. Uh, but what he's talking about is the type of humor that tears somebody down and destroys them. I've been to many comedy shows, and you know where you don't sit in a comedy show? Towards the front. You know why? You get ripped apart if that's the type of com comedian comes out, right? Paul's saying that type of humor has no place amongst the Christian. Instead, instead, when a group of Christians get together, there should be a whole lot of thankfulness. 
Christians ought to be the ones, no matter what is happening in their life, say things like, yeah, but God. All this horrible stuff is going on and so-and-so said this about you and you have all this family brokenness and dynamics. Yeah, but God. I'm so grateful for what God has done in my life. And the world looks at that and says, you're a little cray-cray. It's a little bit weird and it's a little bit crazy. It's a lot of bit weird and a lot of bit crazy from a worldly perspective. So Paul's saying, instead of uh, gossiping and talking about people and, and considering uh, all the things that you could get away with and skirting the law and the things that God has established, uh, maybe be thankful. That when Christians get together, there's one thing that we love to talk about, and that's Jesus and what he did for us. Can you believe, like me, a bigger sinner than you, God washed me and made me clean because of Jesus? That's the talk, and that talk never, ever gets old. Never gets old. Just in case we were thinking that these are suggestions for the church, just in case you're thinking that these are just good affirmations are good things, Paul saying, good suggestions, things you, you should do. Uh, he goes on, verse 5, and says, For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or who is covetous, that is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let me address that parenthesis right there. Most translators put that in parentheses. Being covetous is a form of idolatry. Idolatry is where we place something above God. Covetousness, some of your translations say greed. The idea there is my lust for things or my desire for things becomes my God. All temporal things that could be your job, your money, your spouse, all, any temporal thing that you lust after insatiably is an idolatry. It's, a, it's an idolatry uh, type relationship. So he, he brackets that in parentheses there. And he's saying God's view of sin should be taking, taken very, very seriously. I've told you this example uh, before, but the reason I wrestled in high school is because I was terrible in basketball in middle school. I used to play basketball, and I try really, really hard, and I go to all the practices, and um, I didn't play that much in the games. And I think my eighth grade, seventh or eighth grade year, um, we were uh, winning pretty well. Uh, or losing pretty well, I can't remember. Anyway, either the other term, team was way ahead or our team was way ahead. And the coach is like, fall, get in there. I'm like, yes, this is my shot. I'm going to get in there and play some basketball. And I get in there and I get the basketball and I dribble down the court. I am wide open. Wide open. I go in for a nice layup and I make it. And the other team gets the points. I went the wrong way. That's why nobody... That's why nobody guarded me. Here I thought it was my lightning speed and my quick reflexes and my dribbling skills, but it was, they were just letting me hang myself, as it were. So I scored, and the other team got the, the points. It became apparent that I couldn't play for both teams. I mean, I'm a nice guy. I like people. Even back then, I liked people. But it was very, very obvious. The rules of the game were such that I couldn't play for both teams. When I was scoring a basket in the wrong hoop, I was aiding the other team and making my team furious. In the American Revolution, some of you know this, some of you don't know this, when we... Uh, decided it was time to part from the monarchy and the colonies, the 13 colonies decided they were uh, had uh, enough of the kingship. I think we romanticized the idea that almost everybody were patriots. It's just not real. The reality is maybe maybe 40% of people were patriots. 
These were the people that were like, yes, we get taxed too much and this monarchy thing and state religion and all this kind of stuff, you know, out with that. 40%, maybe as high as 40% of those people existed in the colonies. 20% of the people were loyalists. That means we're like, hey, we like King George, we like the monarchy, we're happy with the way things are going. So 40% against, 20% for, and then that leaves 40% of the people literally tried to keep a low profile. They didn't rock the boat. They didn't really want to jump on a team because they weren't really sure how things were going to play out. And they just wanted to, to stay low and stay low and, and keep a low profile and maybe jump on the winning team. Listen to me. In eternity, you cannot keep a low profile and see how things shake out. Paul, with urgency here, is reminding us of what Jesus taught. Let me, tell, let me share with you what Jesus taught. When Jesus was being accused of casting out demons by Beelzebul, that means he was uh, healing people, he was healing the sick, and he was casting out demons. And instead of saying, that's of God, the Pharisees and the religious leaders at the time said, this guy is the devil, he's, he's got a demon. It was on the backs of this, Jesus gave this long teaching about teams. Let's look at Matthew 12, 30. He says this in response. <clears throat> Listen closely. Whoever is not with me is against me. And whoever does not gather with me scatters. If you are not for Jesus... You are against Jesus. You can't play for both teams. You can't keep a low profile just to see how things play out. If you are not for Jesus, you are against Jesus. You can have the coolest church name. You can have the best graphics and the best signage out there. You can say you include everybody because, well, because you just love. You can pretend that you are preaching the gospel every single week. You can be sincere in those beliefs that you're doing the right thing. And you'd be sincerely delusional. If we do not match what Paul describes as followers of Jesus, then we are not following Jesus. Why am I stressing this? Church, a lot of us are not following Jesus. The church in America is dying. They're on their way to hell thinking they're following Jesus. That the supreme ethic, the most important thing that you can do as a Christian is be kind and be nice and just love your neighbor on the way to hell. If you do not match what Paul describes as followers, then Paul is a lunatic and a liar. And we have to throw out 33 and a third, or a third of our New Testament. Or, we're following somebody else. Next time, Paul tells us why we cannot partner with false followers and what we should do about them. I don't know how many preachers that I come into contact with on a monthly basis crush me. That they don't love people enough to tell them the truth. I don't know how many followers of Jesus I come into contact with that believe the best thing you can do for somebody is enter into their delusion instead of helping them. 
The scariest words I read in Scripture are God gave them up to a debased mind. Some of us are there. We've been given up to a debased mind. Where the worldly ideas make sense. Church, I don't want them to make sense. The minute they start making sense to me, I got a problem. Because they're 100% antithetical to what Scripture is so clear about. And again, this is for believers. So if you're not a believer and you stumbled in here, I am so sorry. You better wait till we get done with Ephesians and then come back. It takes strength, it takes wisdom, it takes courage. To be able to be the type of Christian Paul is calling us to be. What do you get? Persecution. <laughs> Wait a minute. Pastor Paul, I'm supposed to ascribe to following Jesus and happiness isn't my reward? What? Your lifetime, even if you live 90 years, pales in comparison to eternity. And I promise you, if you follow Jesus in your short life here, eternity is going to be awesome. It's going to be great. It's going to be worth whatever sacrifice you think you are making for his kingdom. I'm so passionate about this because I see churches day in and day out that are sacrificing truth at the altar of kindness and charity. It's good to be good. It's nice to be nice. But in reality, following Jesus begins with putting away falsehoods. Seeing ourselves the way we really are. Leading to repentance. Forgiveness and then a heart so full of gratitude you can't contain it and you've got to tell somebody about it. That's the plight of the Christian. So be with us next week as Paul dives further into this. I don't have time to cover the whole idea here today. But Paul will uh, jump into that a little bit more and about how we should respond to people that are proclaiming a false gospel or false teachings. Be with us next week as we do that. Uh, let's pray for strength. This was a tough message. Father, thank you so much for the opportunity just to gather here and dive into your word. Father, these are hard words and hard concepts. And we ask for your strength and your guidance and your spirit to see us through. That we would be the ones that reflect your glory to an otherwise unknowing world that our marks as followers of your son Jesus would be marked with walking in the light full of love and gratefulness and thankfulness that it would cause even the most savage heart to come to know you. That's our prayer this week. It's in Jesus' name we ask these things and the entire church said, Amen. Amen. Be well. Go in peace.